this sermon, Matthew chapter 17, I've called it, I don't have the money. I don't have the money. Actually, Brother Shane gave it to me while I was sitting in Guyana. I spent about five, ten minutes while I was sitting at the table there, and I just kind of penned a little bit of an outline. I filled it with a bunch of notes as I sat here today, but if it's going to be decent and in order, we're going to have to trust the Lord for that today, because it's a, it's a mismatch, and, and it's all on one page, and it'll be interesting for sure. But uh, I don't have the money is the main thrust of this. I don't have the money. I'm going to read the entirety of Matthew chapter 17. The Bible says, And after six days Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elias. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud, which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man, until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elias must first come? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias truly shall come first, or sorry, Elias truly shall first come and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elias is come already, and they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. And then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. And when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is lunatic and sore vexed. For oftentimes he falleth into the fire, and oft into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him. And the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said unto him, or unto them, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Howbeit this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. And while they abode in Galilee, Jesus said unto them, The Son of Man shall be betrayed into the hands of men, and they shall kill him. And the third day he shall be raised again. And they were exceeding sorry. And when they were come to Capernaum, they that received tribute money came to Peter and said, Doth not your master pay tribute? He saith, Yes. And when he was come into the house, Jesus prevented him, saying, What thinkest thou, Simon, of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute, of their own children or of strangers? Peter saith unto him, Of strangers. Jesus saith unto him, Then are the children free. Notwithstanding, lest we should offend them, go thou to the sea, and cast a hook, and take up the fish that first cometh up. And when thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money. That take and give unto them for me and thee. God be with us as we hear this word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. It's very clear what I'm going to be focusing in on, those last few phrases where Jesus casts out and receives of the fish. He's charged Peter, anyways, to cast out and receive and draw that same fish, open his mouth, and at such a time he will receive of the money. So this idea of, I don't have the money, this is quite often, and, and, and expectingly so, the response when anyone is asked to get involved with things of God. 
Okay, we can also put in, you know, I don't have the time, I don't have the energy, I don't have the, you name it, but ultimately the first thing that often comes to the minds of most people is, I don't have the money, especially in regard to these foreign mission trips or going to a soul winning marathon or what have you. And this is my experience even. I'll get a little bit more into it, but my first response of, of mind and, and heart when I'm looking at that invitation for the guy on a trip, I like to say that I'm super spiritual and just jumped in and said, yes, absolutely, I'm going. And these, these thoughts kind of came synonymously and at the same time. But one of those thoughts lingering at the time of my decision was, I don't have the money. Or where am I going to get the money? Here in this passage of scripture in Matthew chapter 7, we have many miraculous things happening. We find Peter, James, and John witnessing the transfiguration of Christ, where he before them showed his glory, not only that of himself, but also that of Elias and that of Moses. They saw the resurrected saints and the one day what will be the resurrected Jesus Christ, transfigured and pictured before them. The Bible says that it's a vision that they were to tell no man. It was something that was special and unique to these three. Now these three experienced this and even heard the voice of God cry out, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And yet when it came to the point, I believe, of doing something that would be seemingly simpler, like casting out a devil, just your run-of-the-mill, spiritual, vexing devil, causing lunatic to this man, they fell short and they lost faith and they could not complete the task. Here, Jesus rebukes the devil first and then turns to rebuke the disciples as they ask, why could we not cast him out? He says, because of your unbelief, you faithless and perverse generation, Jesus almost thinking out loud before the question is even asked him, how long shall I be with you? If you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you can remove a very mountain and it'll depart thence. How can you not deal with this simple, single, little devil? The reality is, is because they had no unbelief. I mean, he gives the caveat a little bit later, granted, that this kind goeth not out by, pra by prayer and fasting. And this is a verse you'll note if, you, if you've ever looked at the uh, corrupted Bible versions that is completely removed. So there is that caveat that Jesus said, hey, this kind of devil goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. There's a little bit of preparation you have to do, but ultimately your main point of failure is that of unbelief. You did not believe that you had the power of God on your side to do such a thing. So, in regard to I don't have the money, you can get this same principle out of it. Quite often what we are missing and what I experienced I needed to do in order to see God's working in my life in this area of I don't have the money and the unbelief and the doubt that is associated with a statement like that is I needed to commit and then follow through by faith. I needed to commit and follow through by faith. And it's a true statement you often see that Christians will get more out of the Christian life if they are willing and able and ready to do three things. The first is to commit or rather be willing to undergo a certain task, a certain challenge, a certain endeavor, a certain work. They need to secondly believe and trust by faith that that will be completed. And thirdly, they need to be willing to suffer a few things. Suffer while they are waiting and be tried and go through that kind of waiting and suffering and, and trying period. You got to be willing, you got to believe, and then you got to be ready and willing to suffer and to wait patiently for these things. And this has to do with all aspects of the Christian life. Even when you were, you were saved and you believed on God, you had to have the willing mind, you had to believe Him by faith, and you had to wait for the response of God to do the saving. And, the, and, and I mean, when we get saved, that happens instantaneously without, you know, it's just a moment in time. It's a birth. It's a, it's a born again experience. But that simple action that is able to be performed by even a little child is something that we should carry with us and continue to perform the Christian life in that same spirit. Think about tithing. It takes the willing mind to say, yes, I will. 
It takes faith to believe that I can follow through. And sometimes you suffer a little bit, right, when you first get into obeying God in this area. How about preaching and doing soul winning and, and that sort of thing? You need to believe, first of all, have the willing mind to go out and perform the work. You need to believe that God can use you in that situation, build confidence in that area, and you need to suffer some things because you're going to be rejected. You're going to have times when you don't want to go, and it's a, it's a, it's a task. It's a long-suffering to get yourself out there and to do the work. Specifically, when we focus here on Matthew chapter 17, those last few verses, beginning in verse 24, we find Jesus, um, his disciple Peter, who again saw that great revelation, saw that great miracle, and was asked the question, does your master pay tribute? Now he just answered, I believe, presumptuously, assuming, yeah, of course everybody does. He says yes. Nevertheless, when he came back, Jesus immediately prevented him and asked him, who do the customs come from? Do they come from the, the local born the own children, or do they come from strangers? Rightly, Peter responded, of course, from strangers, then are the children free. The teaching here is that the local people, the people that are living there, abiding there, born free in the land, ought not to be paying the taxes. This was, this was incorporated by a Caesar that was greedy, and we have the same experience now. We ought not to be paying the taxes, but we should be charging taxes and levies on the stuff as it comes in, or on the people that choose to abide here. Isn't it completely opposite right now, where the people that choose to come here and immigrate here and abide here are given a free ride on the backs of the citizens. We pay for that thing. We pay the taxes. We do all of these things. Nevertheless, Jesus isn't rallying people to pull a Ken Hovind and just rebel against the tax symbol. Though it is a wrong principle for them to impose on us, it is, it is a wrong thing for people, for our Caesar, for our government to impose on their own citizens. Jesus says this. He says, notwithstanding, lest we should offend Lest we should offend them, go cast thy hook, and when you bring in the fish, you're going to find the money. You're going to find what you need. Well, what's the principle here? Hey, it's not right that you're having to pay these taxes, but let me pay them for you. Don't worry about these things. Don't, don't take such strain. Don't try to fight against this system. Hey, just abide here. As much as possibly is within you, live peaceably with all men. He's saying, don't strive against the system. Just trust me to, to bring the money to you. Peter was a fisherman, so this was completely normal to him, although Peter was asked to quit the job for a time. Nevertheless, he gives him that one commission, hey, that one job that, that opened up the opportunity, that one single moment where he could cast and bring in one fish. And Peter's like, what in the world is one fish going to pay for, right? He must have been wondering that. He said, when you open his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money. One fish isn't going to do it, but he opened it, and there's that coin that's needed to pay not only for Peter's tribute, but for Jesus' tribute at the same time. God provided. And that's the thing we need to understand when it comes to, I don't have the money. I don't have the wherewithal. I don't have the means, the resources to work for God. We need to trust that God is able to provide and fill in the gaps of our doubt. A good prayer for us is help thou my unbelief. And how do you help and grow in the area of unbelief? You are tried and you come through something on the other end. And you're not going to doubt the same way looking back. You know, people experience this all the time when it comes to tithing for the first time. You're like, what in the world? I just gave all my grocery money back to the Lord. It's a misunderstanding because the reality is, is that it was the Lord's to begin with. But you receive it as your first fruits. You give the tenth back. And most of the time, most people who are living paycheck to paycheck to paycheck, which is 90% of the world right now, are like, what in the world am I going to eat with? Well, God provides that you cast that net, you jump in by faith, you have that willing mind to believe in him, and he is going to provide the gold that is needed to sustain you, to care for you, to take care of the needs presently that you have. First, or 2 Corinthians 8 deals with the principle of the willing mind. I've been there a few times. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. The Bible says, um, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. It says in verse 11, Now therefore perform the doing of it. Okay? Perform the doing of it. Whether it be the tithe, whether it be the big mission trip, whether it be the, the duty that God has for you at that particular time. Here the Apostle Paul is charging, perform the duty of it. Perform the doing of it. That as there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance out of that which ye have. Okay? So this was the position that I was in, is that I had not the means to go and to visit the country of Guyana for this mission trip. But 
He says, perform the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to will, so shall you follow through, essentially, is what he's saying. Verse 12 highlights this. It says, for if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted, according to that a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. Too often we're thinking about what we hath not. Too often we're thinking about what is the problem before us. But God wants us to believe and trust from the position of what we have. If I got two pennies to rub together and I'm going to apply my willing mind to do the will of the Lord using what I have, the Bible here says that that is accepted. Your willing mind, your spirit that wants to get involved in the work of the Lord, even with those two shiny nickels or pennies or whatever to rub together, is accepted according to that you have. Don't worry about what you don't have. Stand on what you have and give that to God and yield that to God and stand in the position where you're believing God to use you in that very act. I don't have the money. I don't have the money. You got some money. Don't worry about what you don't have, right? You got some faith. Don't worry about what you have. You got some resources. You got some time. Don't worry about what you have. Have a willing mind first. Let God accept it and then do what he can with it. We're to present ourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. That's our reasonable service. So if I am only giving myself, well, that's the most I can possibly have. If I don't have resources in my pocket, if I don't have time in my schedule, the important thing is that I present myself First, that willing sacrifice, and that's what it says in verse 5. And this they did, not as we had hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. We need to give ourselves first unto God. That is the will, that is the wherewithal, that is the desire of our hearts, is to give it to God and let Him take what we do have and use it for His glory. And He will. The mighty calls us to that. The mighty wants us to get involved in these types of things. You go to Psalm chapter 50. In Psalm chapter 50, you're going to find a clear statement that the mighty God, even the Lord hath spoken and hath called the earth from the rising of the sun unto the going down of the same. You know the Bible says that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Well, here is the call. But it's not just for those to be saved. It's for the saved to continue and to grow in these things and to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. But God, he's interesting. And it's, it's, it's wonderful to think of how he would need or how he would desire or how he would command his people to get involved in such things. Especially when he makes statements like you'll read in verse 7. He says, hear, O my people. So he's talking to us. He's talking to believers. Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, and I will testify against thee. I am God, even thy God. I will not reprove thee for thy sacrifices or thy burnt offerings to have been continually before me. I will take no bullock out of thy house, nor he goats out of thy folds. For, so he's saying, hey, I don't even need these things. I won't take these things. Just hear, listen to this. Hear me out. I've called you unto a work. Now look at what I'm about to say. He says, for every beast of the forest is mine. And the cattle upon a thousand hills. I'm not taking th something from you. Rather, I gave it to you, and I'm accepting it back as a sacrifice. Verse 11, I know all the fowls of the mountains, and the wild beasts of the field are mine. I love this. If I were hungry, I would not tell thee, for the world is mine, and the fullness thereof. Verse 14, offer unto thy God thanksgiving, and pay thy vows unto the Most High, and call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. God here is saying, hey, even if I was hungry, if that were such a thing for God to experience, I wouldn't tell thee because I can just go pluck one of these cattle. I can just go take one of these he goats. I can just go and consume one of these wild beasts of the field. It's all mine. I have all the fowls. What do I need from you? And this is the God that gives us according to the measures of his grace, according to the power that he hath. He controls it all. He created it all. He is the Lord over all. And he says, hey, if I was hungry, I wouldn't ask thee. I got it all. I don't need what you have. Psalm verse 70 talks to our faith and our, our doubt. Psalm verse 50 and verse 22. When, when he says this, now consider this, ye that forget God. Lest I tear you in pieces, there be none to deliver. Whoso offereth praise glorifieth me. And to him that 
ordereth his conversation aright, will I show the salvation of God. God wants us to believe in him and not forget him as things transpire in our life. Lest he tear us pieces. Lest he get angry with us. We ought to be in the position where we're taking of the mighty hand of God, doing his calling according to the great calling that he's administered to all and the great charge that he's now giving to his people, to his believers, saying, I've got it all. He says, consider this. You offer praise, you're glorifying me. You order your conversation to write, I'm going to show you the salvation of God. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to show you what this salvation means. Yeah, I'll save your soul, but watch me work in this day. Watch me work in this life. We don't need to forget God. We need to offer God praise for the things that he does, and that's what he desires. And this is why he wants us to be in a position where we don't have in our own hearts and in our own minds everything that God has. Because a lot of people, they think, well, I have it all. I have no need of God. But you need to work from the position of what you have to do more for the glory of God. You need to step. I mean, some people say, hey, I don't have the money to get involved in this. Well, some people have the money. What are they lacking? The time. They're lacking the want. They're lacking the wherewithal. But everybody is from a position of what they have. They need to give God their willing mind and step forward in that vein. You see, God has it all. So even next to the bazillionaire, God has more than you. Walk in the same faith as the guy that's got nothing, and you will be pleasing to God, offering praise unto God, ordering your conversation aright, and you'll be able to watch and see the salvation that he will show you. Psalm 37, Psalm 37, go back a few pages. I'm often in this psalm. Fret not thyself because of evildoers, right? Psalm 37 you're to begin reading in verse 27 or 23. It says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. He delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. For the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. I have been young and now I'm old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. He is ever merciful. And it continues. That's a great promise because too often we think that if we were to allot something back to God, if we were to give of our tithe, next thing you know, our whole family is going to be bagging bread. No, your steps are ordered clearly and plainly by the Lord. And David here makes the proclamation, you can mark it down, that his seed will never beg bread. God promises us things, right? Of course, God promises us food and raiment at a minimum. You're not going to be begging for such things. So get involved in the work of the Lord. Give him an opportunity to show himself strong, to show his salvation that you can give him the praise that is due unto his holy name. I don't have the money. Well, you got something. Work from that position. Offer it to God. Give yourself willingly unto his service and allow him to order those steps of the good man. Allow him to take that delight that you offer into his way, that you feel in your heart, in your very being, to follow after God, to seek after God. Allow God to take what you do have and to use it for his glory. You're not going to be begging bread. Go back to verse 1. It says, fret not thyself. It continues in verse 3. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee, what? The desires of thine heart. If you've got a heart that is meditating upon, a heart that seeks after God, your desires and his desires are going to be one. God's going to bring the scriptures into your life and allow for you to be one in your desires. And what God wouldn't want the same desires to be in his people and to take those same desires and to fulfill them my desire way back was to go into a mission trip into Guyana and see lots of people saved and preach the word of God while I was there I had that desire months ago when I first saw that invitation come into my mailbox and yeah there might have been moments of doubt and wonder and worry and what have you but ultimately I did what I'm preaching about today I committed my willing mind come on in if you like I believed and had faith to respond and to move forward in that same vein. And I followed through with everything that would come in the meantime. So my life and my testimony leading up to this was one that was fairly rocky. There was lots of things to suffer. I saw the opportunity and with that willing mind first, 
I offered it unto God. When that willing mind was accepted by God, even though I had a gap between here and there of all of the monies that I needed, all the time that I needed, God took my willing mind. God took my desire. God took the desire of my heart and he appropriated that, accepted that, and put it into his, pl into his plan. What happened from then on was simply me riding out in faith as God tried to close the gap and get me to that position. If anybody knows the testimony that I had is when I decided I was going to Guyana, I was not in a financial position to do it. I could have easily said, I don't have the money. But I'm sitting there and I'm reading this invitation and my heart, my desire cries out, I want to go. I got to go. My wife comes in and seconds that. I want you to go. You got to go. And from then on, we went through a whole ordeal. I remember the moment that we heard from our landlord. We had just moved into this place, barely been settled there three months. And he says, I'm selling the house. You got to move out. When this happened, it was on the heels of a situation where the place wasn't even ready when we moved in. And so we spent the majority of the first three months kind of homeless and transient, trying to figure out what we were going to do. How are our things be damaged? What was going to be going on? We were in turmoil. We weren't comfortable. We weren't able to settle in. And during that time, I had a meeting with this landlord where he invited me in and he tried to smooth things over and give his plan going ahead. And I sat there with this guy and I gave him the gospel in three different ways, including playing the entire Bible way to heaven. And although this guy seemed liberal and this guy seemed kind of just on the fence about this whole thing, I didn't have a doubt when I walked away that the man was saved, right? It baffled me because I didn't see the works that would follow, but he seemed like he was a good guy just kind of on the liberal side of things. It, it, seemed, it seemed confusing and this is why I went over the gospel three times with him. But when I left that place, I remember saying to my, my wife, because he had testified that he wanted to get involved in ministry and missions. He wanted to get more involved in the things of God. And he sort of had that desire, but he didn't have the time. And he wasn't willing to allot the time. Well, God was ready to fulfill both his desire and my desire. As I walked away, I said to my wife, I said, I feel like he's going to pay for my mission trip. I, I feel like God's going to use this man who's got this money to pay for that mission trip. So when we found out we were getting kicked out of our place and the new place was coming, glory to God, those things started to move smoothly. The landlord offered to pay for the movers. Great. I love that. I don't have to live things. The place that we found was actually significantly cheaper than the one we have and actually a nicer and better place. So we had, we had moved on up and we're paying less for, for better quality. And then this, he says, I'll give you, for your troubles, a lump sum of cash. <laughs> and it's just like, ding. And the timing for that was literally while I was standing in Guyana in the rainforest. The money comes in. Okay? So I had to go from the position of, I don't have the money. What am I going to do here? I stepped out and with a willing mind said, I'm going. I followed on with faith, believing that that's where I was going, and even advanced the money in order to get to the position where I'm standing, having it all come back to me. This isn't a prosperity gospel. This isn't name it, claim it. You're going to just throw prayers out into the air and come back with riches and wealth. And I understand that there was also other factors in it. People uh, willingly gave into my ministry and the opportunity to go because they wanted to reap a part of the harvest that was there. And I thank everybody that participated in that way. But to see God answer a specific prayer, a specific uh, like option, the, 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 there was no option. To see the fact that I was standing there when the money came in to cover the whole trip, that's what builds your faith and that's what eliminates the unbelief from your life. God, its desire is, yes, to reach, reach lost people. And he was able to fulfill that desire through me. That man's desire was to get involved in missions. And it was a weird way of doing things. And there was a lot of struggle. But he actually got involved in missions. Unbeknownst to him. God has his way of ordering our steps, as the Bible promises here in Psalm chapter 37. To the good man who's delighted himself in the law, who's committed his way unto God, who's trusting in God and walking in the righteousness that belongs unto God, God finds a way to fulfill the desires, fulfill the needs, fulfill the pleasures of his own heart to the one that will yoke himself with them. The Bible says, faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. God calls us to get involved in the Christian ministry, does he not? We've all been given the ministry of reconciliation. 
And so why is the number one response of Christians who, hey, come and get involved in this mission trip. Hey, come and get involved in this marathon. Why do we hear so often, I don't have the money? When I can stand here and tell you by my own testimony what I have, the reason is because they do not believe, because there is no faith. And so baby steps is what some of us need to do. And some of us, our biggest problem with not taking the baby steps that are needed in order to grow in unbelief and to have faith in God to provide, I had a really big thing that I needed God to provide for. But you know what happened five, six years ago? I was in a little thing obedient to him. Well, baptism. There's a first, right? I had to step out, commit my mind unto him, and by faith get dunked. That's easy. The next one was tithing. This is where so many Christians are falling short. You wonder why God's not blessing you financially. God's not upholding your needs and your wants and your desires financially. Too often people look and can be looked at and realize that they're falling short of the tithe. That was my proving ground. My proving ground way back was making that commitment to tithe the tenth unto the Lord and to just give him what is rightfully his and trust him to sustain me. And all along the way, when I gave my willing mind to him, I've never regretted it because he sustained me along the way. A few years after I got into tithing, I got into missions giving. I realized now a lot of it was probably of not, but that's not my responsibility. Before God, I committed myself to give a larger amount of money consistently off every pay to go to missions. And I did that from the position where, hey, I don't have the money. <laughs> but what I did was I gave God the desire of my heart. I jumped in with that willing mind. I believed him to provide, and I went through some things along the way. And so now here I am, six or seven years into that, and I've grown to the point where I can say, I'm going to this mission trip. I don't have the money. I have to pay rent. I have to do all these things. I have a job that I have responsibilities towards. I could just say, nah, I'm not doing it. But God has brought me to a point where I've grown, and I can just jump into these things. I'm not trying to say that I'm some big and bad guy, but I have got a big God who answers prayer and Amen. takes the steps of a good man and orders them himself. Why? Because I delight in his ways, because I'm committing my way unto him, because I'm trusting in him. And people need to get over this. I don't have the blank. God has it all. Did he not say, hey, if I was hungry, I wouldn't tell you, because I have the cattle on a thousand hills. I've got the the the. I've got everything. There's nothing that I've fallen short of achieving, of, of responsibility over. I am God. I am the Lord over all. And yet we doubt and we worry and we wonder. The Bible says in Luke chapter 1 and verse 37, With God shall nothing be impossible. And that's true if we're aligning our steps, if we're with God and we're on board with what He wants for us, then he will provide for even that which seemeth to be impossible in our eyes. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 13, the Bible says, Philippians 2 and verse 13, says, For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So it's amazing that God desires our willing mind as that acceptable sacrifice takes what we have presently now and does even greater things with it. The impossible can be done if it starts with a willing mind and it starts with us offering even the widow's might of what we have. God then works that same thing in you. And we need to trust God to give us, remember when they, the disciples said, increase our faith, Lord, it's because they were little babies in the area of faith. But as they were tried, as they were proven, as they had seen greater things done, their faith was bigger and suddenly the baby steps didn't seem so challenging unto them. God does the work. God puts the will into our heart, but it's going to be a gradual thing. We have to first have the willing mind and allow for God to take those things and use them to his glory. Verse 19 of Philippians chapter 4 says, My God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And that statement, according to, I love that. Because it doesn't say God shall supply out of his riches. When we have money, we supply things out of our money. Even the millionaire supplies out of his money. When he gives, when he spends, when he provides, it's always out of what he has. But God here provides according to his riches. That means that his riches are 
innumerable. His wealth is unsurpassed. He has everything, and according to the riches and the glory that he has in Christ Jesus, he supplies and replenishes. He supplies, it replenishes. He supplies, it replenishes. You don't have to worry about draining God. The only measure that drains God, limits God, restricts God's working in your life is how much willingness, how much faith you're going to put into our very big God. And we read way back in Matthew chapter 17 at the beginning of this study. God says, hey, even a grain of mustard seed, even the least of the seeds of faith in prayer with fasting can move mountains. You can do great exploits just giving a little bit of faith to a very big God. So we don't need to ask anymore or make that statement rather, I don't have the money. I don't have the money. I don't have the money, right? And we're using something that's so silly as money to make the example of, you know, I don't have the time. I don't have the smarts. I don't have the knowledge. There's all these things that Christians use as excuses to hold ourselves back. I once heard somebody was asking, uh, asking somebody, hey, why don't you come to church? And they said, I'm out of peanut butter. The dumb excuses that people come up with. I don't have the blank. You can leave it there. But the reality is, is that we have out of the supply, no, according to the riches, according to the supply that God has, innumerable things at our disposal, innumerable riches at our disposal, infinite riches at our disposal, if we'll only approach God with a heart of faith, a willing mind, and we don't need to doubt anymore. So the practical that I want to get out of this is, hey, commit, <laughs> just commit to something, try it out today, it can be a little thing, Commit to something. Decide, hey, I'm going to get involved in tithing. Decide, hey, I'm going to get involved into regular giving to mission trip. Hey, I'm going to go to this mission trip that's six months, seven months, a year, two years from now. Jump on an opportunity. Commit to God today and say, I'm in 100% all the way. Lord, you take that and do with it what you will. Hey, get ready for rocky times along the way. Like I said, it wasn't pleasing being somewhat homeless during that turbulent time. But when God put in my heart and told me, hey, that guy's going to pay for that thing, I was like, what in the world? How is that ever going to happen? This guy is seemingly against me. He seemingly has money just at his fingertips. This is what he wants right now. He's not interested in living the Christian life. How is he going to help me go on this trip? And the reality is, is God just basically said, I'll show you. I'll show you. And that's all I had to do is go, okay, Lord, show me. I don't have the money is no excuse for Christians. I don't have the time should be no excuse for Christians. I don't have the God will provide according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Just got to trust him. Commit to something. Believe God will provide it and hold on. Get ready to suffer some things. And then the next time you're looking back on the same situation, you've grown in faith. Your unbelief has diminished. And now what? Commit to something. Trust by faith for God to pull you through it. And then just hold on and get ready. And this is the Christian life. You'll just keep growing and growing and growing and growing through him. And he will provide the will. He will provide according to his good pleasure to sustain you through all of these challenges.